Welcome back everyone, Mike McConville here. Man, it looks like spring has finally arrived. Yeah, we've got two tellies here today. We're going to kind of walk you through this. you got to check these out. Have a look at this one. This is an ASAT telly by GNL. Leo's Last Stand. And look at the wood on this neck. Absolutely tantalizing. Let me give you another view. Okay, here's the edge of the neck. This is the quilted maple book match top. And as gorgeous as it is, he just never fell in love with this thing. It was never quite right. You've heard that story a few times. Well, we're here to make it right. On the XLT unit here, we're going to walk you through this step by step by step. From unplayable to perfection. Now, Paul had made an appointment, drove up last week, and dropped this telly off. So this is the real deal, made in California, and once again, as beautiful as it looks, it's terrible to play. Wildly out of tune, even with the compensated saddles. So we're going to walk you through both of these tellies today, step by step by step. Of course, both of them are getting compensated nuts, and you will hear how tantalizing a telly can sound when it's perfectly in tune and plays smooth as silk. So I will do the two of these guitars in tandem. So this Asset telly I'm doing on the XLT. The XLT is fine in this case because the, the, the only discrepancy really is at the neck joint. So we'll be masking this off and dressing it. And as you've seen in hundreds of other videos I've done, uh, masking off a maple neck is definitely uh, more of a challenge uh, than the rosewood fingerboard. And it's the same deal here. We've got a maple neck to mask off. Half the job is masking it so that you don't leave any smudge marks or for that matter any trace that the guitar was ever touched ultimately if you do your job right. Paul's California Tele will be done on the GPS unit. Let's get started.
So this one's all masked off and ready for dressing. I'm doing these two tellies in tandem. So I'll go over to Paul's tally now. Same deal. I'm going to bring you in on this ASAT first and kind of show you what we have to deal with as far as leveling goes. Now normally in the case of the XLT unit, because it's just one block, I usually switch over to the GPS unit which has more support along the entire length. Like that tricky Explorer we did last video. Now in this case, the high spots are here and here. And there's another high spot here, across here. Because the two high spots, in this case, are right where the support block is, and we're not actually going full length, we're just going to hit those high spots, and then when we go full length, we'll be switching over to those crowning blocks with that vinyl underlay. So that'll just flex over. It's not going to lower the frets because it's just 400 grit sandpaper. So this spot here, well, of course, it's supported by the body, so there's no flex in that. So we're going to nick those two high spots, and this needs a fret dress anyway. There's quite a bit of wear marks from the strings in this. So that's where we are with this guitar. Let's have a look at Paul's uh, American Telly. We've got two spots to contend with, one here and one here. All the way across, this fret is high. And some string wear marks to come out in this as well. As you can see, Masking off these maple necks is, is a huge part of the fret dress. You don't have to contend with that with rosewood and uh, ebony fingerboard. So we're ready to go on both of these. It'll be relatively quick to hit those high spots and then we'll get on to recrowning and buffing and polishing. Okay, so we'll start with this one. There was a comment on that last video, the uh, Explorer video. A fella had asked me about uh, why you crosshatch. You know, he brought up that phrase that I've used in the video. So what I mean by crosshatching is you got to remember that the the actual file itself is dead flat. The fingerboard actually has a curvature. When I talk about crosshatching, I'm talking about moving, always moving along the string pass, so the file doesn't tilt. It's always got to be in line with the strings, no matter where you're filing. But when I say cross-hatching, as I move up the neck, I'm moving across the radius, like so. Obviously doing this in slow motion to, um, to show you. And then I'll go in the opposite direction, like this. So to exaggerate, the file is actually going across the radius, overlapping my strokes as I go. So I go obliquely in this direction, like this, and then when I come back the other way, those overlapping strokes like that catch all those high spots, and in a lot of cases, high spots that these $135,000 CNC machines miss. I don't want my comments uh, about the CNC machine misinterpreted, like there was one fellow that made a comment about, well, there's lots of guitars that are done flawlessly with a CNC machine. And I absolutely agree with that. The combination of the perfect operator and the CNC machine set up perfectly for that particular guitar or those particular guitars. Sure, that's a winning combination. The point I was trying to make with that Explorer, uh, which was done with a CNC machine that missed a bunch of spots, and it's not the first time I've seen that, my point was, the tech deck owners around the world, they're doing this type of work all the time and they're catching stuff that the CNC machine misses. And you know something? They didn't dish out $135,000. So that was the point I'm making. So now I can go actually full length. And this is another argument for removing the nut. Now we're putting a compensated nut in anyway. But by removing the nut, that gives me 100% access to the entire length of the fingerboard. 
So let's check our high spots. Done, done, done. And we got rid of those faint string marks as well. Let's go to that ASAT telly. With this guitar, we've got the high spot here and we've got a high spot here. Because this high spot is so close to the pivoting support block, uh, we don't need all this support along here because we don't need to level. These frets are level. They've already been checked. So we've got these two spots and we got this spot. So let's go ahead and do that. Even though the high spot is here and here, I still start at the nut and make my way out. You can hear that file, it just slips along, there's nothing grabbing. So we don't need the support here because we're not leveling. That neck does flex for sure in between these two points, but because we're not leveling there, we're fine. Here you have lots of support. You've got that big square chunk of maple bolted into the body. No flex in here, you don't have to worry about that. So again, I'm cross hatching, moving obliquely across the frets but keeping the actual file in line with the string path. When you're crowning the frets at the top of the fingerboard, you've got the body to contend with on either side. I start in the middle of the fret, highest part of that radius, and work down towards the outside edge. Now you notice how I'm, I'm tilting the file, and I put equal strokes on each side. So I'm kind of coaxing it back to center, but I don't finish it with the file, I just take that squareness out. So here, same thing, just taking away that squareness. I never touch the center of the crown with the crowning file. Where the leveling file has gone across the frets and squared off that crown, that's what I'm taking off with this crowning file, taking those sharp edges off either side. Now I come around the other side, and again, starting at the center of the fret, the top of the radius, and then work down towards that outside edge. So this is why setting the guitar up properly and making it buttery smooth to play, it's not just about it being nice to play. It affects the accuracy of the intonation, big time. We're addressing two things at once. We're making the guitar physically nice to play and we're helping it to play much more accurately in tune. You can see that this portion of the neck is no, no issue. I can go all the way across. There's no body in the way to contend with. I'm gonna bring you in close because this is the fret that got the biggest hit. I want you to see how square it is after it's been leveled. So before I crown that, we're gonna bring you in for a closer look right now. So you see that squareness? Here is what you do with the crowning file. So I go one, two, three, one, two, three. You can see I'm reducing the width of the tooling swath of the file, and that's all I really want to do. I just want to get rid of those square edges on either side of the crown, and you'll see when we go to the next stage. Okay, I'm just kind of checking this quickly. A little bit of squareness here, we'll take that out. So this was the fret that took the biggest hit on uh, Paul's guitars. So I'm coaxing that crown back to center. To finish the job, I've got to come around to the other side because the body's in the way. I can't go all the way across. Good, okay, I'll, okay, I'm liking that. That's looking great. This is going to make a huge difference to this guitar. Okay, we got our 400 grit and we're just going to just going to glide right over that heel toe. I don't know if you remember that in the last video or not. Heel. See, when I push this way, I get this side of the fret. When I pull, I get the far side of the fret. This soft vinyl underlay flexes as it goes across those crowns. It does not lower the height of the crown. It's 400 grit sandpaper. All it's doing is scrubbing the crowns back to center. So I'll bring you in for another look right now. You can see for yourselves. So you can see now all of that squareness is gone. I'm moving the camera very slowly so you can see the crowns of all of these frets are nice and round. They were pretty flattened out when we started into this job. So now we're stepping up to a 600 grit and this is going to bring us that much closer to the final finish. 
This will take out the remaining scratch marks of the file and the scratch marks of the 400 grit. That is what it looks like. I'm moving slowly here so the camera can get a focus after the 600 grit. So load up this uh, canvas wheel. Some compound. And this will give us our final sheen. Now you can see why we go to all that trouble to mask off that maple fingerboard perfectly so that just the crowns of the frets are exposed. If not, you'd destroy that maple fingerboard with black smudge marks all over it. Again, like I've said so many times before, if you're doing this type of work, you want to cover your tracks. If you've done your job right, it should look like the guitar's never been touched. Same deal here, we're just we're taking out all those tooling marks of the, of the mill file. This is our 400 grip. Either of these guitars could have been done on the XLT because with Paul's guitar there's just these spots up here and then the string wear. So we didn't really need the full support along the entire length of the neck. In most cases, especially that Explorer video that you just saw me do, it needed support full length. So if you're getting into leveling fingerboards and doing full length fret dresses, the full telescopic pivoting neck support on the GPS unit is the better choice. If you're just doing light fret dresses at the neck junction and basic setups, the XLT is plenty. So the other thing I wanted to mention, and I, I did point this out in my classes for years, you don't want infinite torque on this thing. If I push down, it'll stop. Yeah, it'll stop. So you're buffing, but you don't want to burn. Just wanted to point that out. Okay, this is yet another tip. When you buff these frets out, you generate a fair amount of heat from the friction. So I let this Asat telly cool off while I went and buffed out Paul's uh, American uh, California telly. So these frets are all stone cold now. Now it is safe to peel off all of the masking tape. I like to sort of jack the guitar up a little bit and have a float in midair so I can get at that neck. It just gives me better access to the tape, so when I'm peeling it off, I'm not struggling with the neck assembly in the way. I do like to go over and remove that black residue of the compound before I pull the tape off. So again, what we're trying to do here is we're avoiding any chance of getting ugly black smudge marks all over that clean white maple. So again, I kind of jack that neck up and that gives me access to the edges of the uh, tape. Everything is immaculate. It looks like the guitar's never been touched. Okay, now we're on to the setup. We're also doing these two compensated nuts in tandem. There's step one for the Asat, step one for the California Telly. Looks like 135 should fit into that slot nicely. 
and 135 it is. Next we verify a perfect radius for the underside of that ledge. Now I've radiused the actual crown. We have lots of material to file out for the slots and to cut our compensated values. The bottom of the leg that's going into that slot now is matched to the fingerboard radius. Of course it's way too high so now we got to bring it down. And here's our next step. So we got that 135 thou leg press fit. We've got a beautiful press fit on that both sides. Obviously this is still way too high. We've got a beautiful radius match but the whole thing has to come down. Anybody remember that old Alabama tune? She's close enough to perfect. So now we use that original nut with this super sharp pencil. So I got a 16 thou Hosco file here. I'm just scoring those nut slots right now. Okay, when I flip it, I got 42 on the bottom, so I can use that 42 to kind of, I can open up the 6th string with that, I can open up the, even the 5th string, even the 4th string. 3rd, I'll flip back to 16 for now. 2nd string and 1st string. These are 10 to 46 strings at concert pitch, and that is the next stage, so I cut the approximate values. After doing this a few times, as you can imagine, I got a good idea where this is going to end up, but that's where I'm starting. I just thought I'd show you that. So this is that self-adjusting radius gauge you saw me make up there a little while ago in the video. The idea is to line up the two outside strings for the action that you prefer. Then I hike up the middle four strings out of the way and then drop them down until they just kiss that piece. You can see that's a very low density foam. It will not hold the strings up. And that is how I consistently get a perfect match to the fingerboard radius at the bridge. So we'll check the... 12 fret fretted note. Make sure we tune that. Okay, you can see we're about, we're about four and a half cents sharp. first. You can see why we left a lot more height and a lot of material to work with because we have to work all this to get right. That's pretty darn close, just a little tiny bit sharp. Again, always fret the 12 fret note first. That's the one you want to check. See how flat that is? That definitely tells you that this slot needs to be cut back because the string is actually contacting deeper in the slot. Because the highest point of contact right now, because this is just rough cut, is deep in the nut. That's the highest contact and that's why it's registering flat. We're going to file it out and we're going to read it again. Fretted note first. Mm, yeah, I can live. 
live with that. Let's go to the G string. Yeah, I can tell you right now, we've got the same thing going on with the, with the G string. The highest point of contact is deep into the neck. Because I, I just filed it out roughly for string spacing. I got a 26th thou here. I'm just going to coax that forward and we'll get another reading. I just want to make sure that the string's highest point is at the leading edge of the nut. And here's the result after filing that to the leading edge. 12 fret note, fretted, and open string. Perfect. Fretted 12 fret note, and open. So that's a little sharp too. No issue with that. Fretted note and open string. It's a little bit sharp too. Fretted note. Perfect. And you were thinking we're all done. No, we're not letting you off that easy. Here's our final calibration. Open string and fretted first fret note. It's got to come down. This is the last adjustment here. You gotta be ultra careful. One stroke of the file too much, and you're starting over. So how critical is this? Well, if I lean on the body, it'll change the note. Even with your tech deck, you gotta make sure you're not leaning on the body when you check that. This is a level of precision that we're talking here. Okay, we've arrived. One string out of six is right. Let's go to the A string. Okay, well, you can see that's eight cents sharp. So that's got to come down. Oh, yeah, baby. Okay, D string. And first fret. It's 15 cents sharp. So that's obviously going to come way down. Still sharp. That's as close as it's going to get. G. Okay, that's like 20 cents sharp. This Hosco file is actually a 26. I'd rather have it be a little too big than to have it too small. And that prevents all that kinking and grabbing on the nut. Okay, let's try that again. Our G. The calibration values for the compensated nut are already cut. This is strictly about the height of the string. That's it for that string. Okay, here's the B. And first. That's it. We're okay, so okay, let's have another look at that first string. Perfect. Now we're strictly making it look pretty and trimming back those outside tips. And this is the completed compensated nut, and you'll hear it in a second.
we have arrived. This tally is a hundred percent. And I'm bringing you in because I want to show you that there isn't a hint of a smudge mark anywhere on that immaculate fingerboard. And that, as radical as it looks, is a perfectly compensated nut, 10 to 46 strings, tantalizingly accurately in tune. Have a listen. And I have to admit that these Fender compensated saddles they're pretty good. I think they finally got this right. It was a bit of a forced play because Glendale, Callahan, Barden, Wilkinson, they were all making replacements for tellies and Fender had to get on board to gain that market share I guess. There's a couple of different ways you can look at this. I didn't have to actually file those saddles. When you get into the finest adjustments super minute adjustments, the final adjustments for the intonation. If one string is sharp and one string is flat, as long as you've got that radius very, very close, let's just say that this string was perfect and this string was slightly flat. In other words, this needed to come forward, that needed to stay where it is. Well, you can actually get away. Now, this is a very, very minute adjustment you make right at the very end. To make this note rise up a little bit, normally what you would do is you would move the saddle forward, but you can't because this half of the saddle is perfect. But what you can do is you can actually crank the height adjustment just a quarter of a turn to raise that up a little tiny bit. And that's what I did all the way across on these strings. And you'll hear when I plug this in in the house, it is absolutely perfectly in tune. Just one more hint. Hope you've enjoyed this. And that is it for Paul's Corona California Telly. One more telly intonated within an inch of its life. Case closed. We're back to the Asat Telly and it looks like we're going to be an eighth of an inch or 0.1255. So this leg for our blank needs to be cut down to 0.125 to get a nice press fit into that slot. The American one was another 10 thou thicker. Okay, we got that leg down to 125. Well, we've got that curvature on. Now we want to transfer that curvature to the, to the ledge. Now that we've got a match on the underside of that ledge, now we're going to put that radius on the actual crown. So what you really have to pay attention to is to make sure that you've got enough thickness in that crown to allow for the slots and for cutting the values. Got a beautiful press fit there. It's not wiggling or jiggling. The crown itself is radiused. We've got lots of forgiveness on both sides. We'll probably cut that back a little bit. As I've mentioned in numerous other videos, you always want to leave lots of real estate on both sides to allow you the luxury to make that final adjustment side to side to line up the two outside strings. Our next step is we finish this beautiful radius on the underside of the ledge, matches the fingerboard perfectly, and so does the leg that goes into the slot. So now we need to bring this down until that ledge rests on the fingerboard. So we're just going to use that original nut to get that spacing right. I've got a ultra sharp pencil here. Okay, I start with my 16 thou just to kind of score the center line for each of those nut slots. Then I turn it and I've got 42 on the bottom. Now this is going to be a 46 string, but that's enough just to get us started. I can use that for the... We'll slip back to this 16 for the E, a and e B, and G strings. I've got a 50 thou file here. I'm going to open it up just a little bit more. Got a 26 file for that third string, and then I'll go back again for the second string and the first string. So you can see why we leave lots of real estate in that crown. 
we want plenty of material to work with. So this is where I'm starting for the 9 to 46 strings tuned to concert pitch. So I did this before I actually string it up. So next I'm just going to smooth out these gap marks here. I wasn't going to show this but I thought, you know something, this is just too cool to pass up. There's seven quality control signatures on this heel before they put it on the guitar. In order to buy back 100% adjustability at the bridge, I have installed this 20 thou Brazilian rosewood no less shim and that is going to allow us complete adjustability. This will all make complete sense in a second when we go back to the bridge. See how that self-adjusting radius gauge, it, it's just floating, there's almost no tension at all. But it's actually touching the first string and the sixth string. These middle four strings are actually hiked up out of the way. We're looking very carefully and I'm dropping that down until that string just touches. So third string. That's it. I don't want it to push the radius gauge down. I'm just getting it to just kiss that. I'm good with that. Now we've got a perfect match to the fingerboard radius. String spacing, intonation values, and, f and open string and first fret notes are all now perfect. Now, and only now, we can trim those outside edges back. And once again, the reason I do that is it allows me that little bit of forgiveness right at the end. You see how much work goes into one of these things. When I get right to the end, I can line up to make sure that the strings are equidistant from the outside of the neck. So right at the very end I just shifted this a couple of thou to line up those strings perfectly. Now we're ready to smooth this out, make it look pretty, and glue it into place. Just regular carpenter's glue. You want to think about the next guy that might have to take this out. <laughs> whether it be 10 days or 10 years from now.